Uh, so thus far, up to this point, we've been talking about um, diversity and unity within the church, the local church. But this morning, I want to talk about similarity. Um, and so what are some uh, potential dangers for not thinking about similarity in a class like this? That's not rhetorical. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Right. And so um, now you need similarities because there's some good things that come out of similarities, as we'll see today in the lesson. But let's just review for a second. Uh, uh, unity and diversity are biblical. Uh, what's an example of uh, biblical uh, unity and diversity we talked about in week one? Week one, what's an example of biblical unity and diversity? There you go, man, creation of man and woman, all right? They were one unit, and yet they're diverse. As man and as woman, right? Uh, unity and diversity are gospel issues. What do I mean by gospel issues? What did Christ do at the cross? Ephesians. That's right. He brought two hostile parties and made one new humanity. He reconciled us at the cross. To the Father, vertical, and horizontal, one another, right? Unity and diversity brings glory to God. What's an example of this that we see in the scriptures? Revelation. There you go. Yes. I'm like, man, I'm a horrible teacher. No one's, no one's getting it all. I'm, I'm about to break out in the sweat. All right. All right, we are image bearers. What does that mean? Yes. So how does that how does that impact us as we reach other people? That's right. They share the image as well, right? Um, what's the example about the cell phone image? There you go, crack screen. <laughs> All right. Woo, man. Y'all making me work hard today. Man, that week off. Woo. Okay, so this was a review. These are the previous weeks. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Great job. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so we are image bearers. We bear the image of God. And so as we look at other people, we realize they are fellow image bearers. And as we mentioned about the example of the uh, cracked cell phone face, the crack cell phone face, um, as we look at individuals, we realize they're, unless they're in Christ, their image might be distorted. But we don't discard them. Um, they need to be made renewed uh, in the image of Christ so they can see clearly. And we can see them clearer as well. All right. Um, I mentioned earlier, we talk about the similarity in the church because we need to examine the value of similarity because we need to understand all that God has built into our congregation, not, di not just diversity. So if in your mind you're thinking, okay, um, because of this class, I only need to make friends with people who are different than me. I need to find some African-American friends. I need some Chinese, Asian-American friends. I need friends from this country because, oh, I got too many friends that look like me. If that's what you're coming up because of this class, it is wrong. Uh, but there are some benefits because of similarity, as we will mention here. And yet... Uh, later on, there does need to be a balance in your life. Uh, 
because the gospel is uh, very important. All righty. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I thought I just said that. All right. Must have been the bold effect. I'm trying new stuff, you know. You know working on. All right, so here's some dangers we need to avoid. Um, avoid being in a... Uh, Avoid being a church that only befriends those who are similar to us, right? And so uh, there's a, or it can be a problem where uh, congregation can uh, be so uh, one ethnic group or one culture, that, and that becomes their norm that anything else that's outside of that is looked upon like, whoa. Uh, I mentioned, uh, <coughs> I don't know if I mentioned this class, but... I remember going to a funeral, and we used to have night worship, and the church I attended uh, was pretty much predominantly African-American, and so um, this Anglo couple used to come all the time, their kids, to Sunday evening service, you know, they, they understood the doctrine of grace, they really appreciated that, it was like you preach the gospel, our church doesn't have worship on the evenings, and we'll be here, and so got to know them really well. And so, unfortunately, um, one of the kids got hit by a car and died. And so, naturally, you're, you know, we got to know you as part of your body. So, we showed up at the funeral. They were on that side. We were on this side. And when we sat in the church, I mean, it was like on cue. Everybody in the congregation did this. I was like, oh. Oh, wow. I felt like, oh, my goodness, I'm in the wrong place. I thought this was the house of God. I felt so bad. And I felt so bad it's never left me. That, that feeling has never, ever left me. And I purposely, uh, whenever I'm in a church or wherever, I'm friendly. Because that, uh, I was friendly prior to that because I'm from the South. If you're from the South, you know what I'm talking about. The real South. <laughs> <laughs> Not this blended northern south, uh, you know, Mississippi, Gulf Coast. All right. So um, I was friendly because that's how I grew up. My grandmother inviting people over out the church. Uh, always had enough food to send it home with them or always cooking something. It was very friendly. Uh, and so when I experienced that, I was like, wow, the coldness from that. And any place that should be inviting and loving is the house of God, right? When you come to church, everybody should be welcome there because everyone needs to hear the gospel. And so uh, we need to avoid being a church that only befriends those who are similar to us. Also, we need to avoid feeling guilty for any relationship where we have more than Christ in common, right? So there's both extremes. You can be like, oh, no, we, no, you're not welcome here. Or you can be like, oh, I need more African-American friends. I need more Asian-American friends. Oh, wow, all my friends look just like me. They work at the same place. Ah. So that's the other extreme. So you need to avoid both of them. And as you'll see in the Bible over and over and over again, the Bible stresses balance. And so even with the gospel, you can go too far to the left. And allow everything. Or you can go too far to the right and be legalistic. And so the Bible teaches balance. And so many times, uh, that's why you got to constantly uh, be in prayer with the Lord. Because you need balance in your life. Um, and not when you don't have balance, it shows up. <clears throat> so, again, two extremes we need to avoid. Uh, here's some uh, problems uh, with thinking that similarity is bad. It's not how we were made. Think about it. We crave understanding. And when you have someone that's similar to you, as we'll talk about uh, later on, uh, it helps give understanding. We want to understand what's going on. We want to understand ourselves. That's why we go to doctors. That's why we have peer groups. We want to understand uh, what, am, what am I dealing with. You've been through this before. Can you help me out? What's going on? You know? Uh, people who share our background or share our similar backgrounds can offer us help. Uh, next is short-sighted. 
Um, there can be some real good spiritual benefits associated with similarity. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but that's good. Uh, it can be uh, paralyzing. What's that? Oh, all right. We need to have a balanced approach in our relationships. So think about it. Uh, if you're thinking about evangelism, you think, well, I only do evangelism in a church setting. Then you negate doing it in your job, in your career, in your family, and those type things. So you need to have a balanced approach. Um, a real good conversation I had with a student, uh, maybe five years ago, uh, his uh, campus guy prior to me, uh, he looked up to him. He says, I want to go to seminary. I want to get in apologetics. I want to be just a real good guy knowing stuff that really incites me. And I was like, okay, have you been called? He's like, what's that? I, I just want to go do it. And I said, well, you can't idolize someone and go to seminary based on their gifts. You have to go based on what God has gifted you to do. And he looked confused. And I said, do you know? that God has uniquely gifted everyone in the body of Christ to be beacons of light in whatever endeavor they are in life. It's like, it's like you've never heard this before. And I said, you know, you could be a Christian photographer and show the uh, light of Christ there. And tears fell down his face. And shortly after that, he resigned. But now, I, I wasn't upset because now he was had freedom to actually live out that principle, doing what he loved to do. And so right now, he's a, a web designer uh, for Fayette County Public Schools and also a webmaster. And also, he has a business as a Christian photographer. You know, and so uh, it's so important um, that um, as we talk to people, we need to have a balanced approach. Not only uh, as we share the gospel, but a balanced approach in our understanding about the gospel. Uh, again, the Bible teaches balance. And when you get out of balance, it messes us up. And that affects some churches because if you're not a preacher, you're not a deacon, they don't see if you're doing, they don't notice you doing effective ministry. But no matter what vocation you're doing, if you're a Christian, it's important. And so that's something uh, the priesthood of believers uh, is very important. And so I, I teach that to students because a lot of time it's not taught in a perception we have towards ministry is like if you're not in these roles you're not important and that's not true all right okay all right i'll try i'll try it okay all right okay <laughs> right right that's what i was like all right okay <laughs> all right so you tell i was a little tired yesterday i was trying to do stuff all right uh god's purpose for similarity in the church uh, people who understand you can instruct you better. Um, if you turn to Titus chapter 2, let's read verses 1 through 8. Someone want to read that out loud? All right, so what, how is um, God uh, leading Paul here? He's equipping them, right? Build them up. Uh, knowledge, you see that in uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the purpose, he's building up in knowledge, right? Uh, and so as he's given these instructions, 
who is to be teaching who? We just read it. Older who? Older men teaching who? And older women? Now, why didn't he leave this to the pastors? Ah! <laughs> that's, that's what, all right, okay, all right. That is true. It's not enough. Of them. But also, women, older women, know something about being young, right? And uh, they can address, like we were just talking, she was like, I was like, it's cold air. She was like, no, it's perfect to me. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> See there, you know, I don't know anything about that. I was like, all right, let's move on. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so you're, you're able to, because of that similarity, build relationships based on that. Because, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm hot. Oh, wow. See, they have this extra that's the cause. <laughs> right. So it's like, hey, all right. That's why y'all sit in this section, right? So the similarities. Um, everyone that's in this group that Paul is addressing, they have similarities, right? Uh, as being an older man, I can teach a younger kid something, right? Because I've been there. Oh, I know what you're thinking. I have an idea what you may be going through because I've been there. So the similarity that uh, we have, because we're similar, I shouldn't use the same word to define the word, but uh, because we're similar, we're able to help each other out. And that was a prime example right there. That's a high five, because you're like, yeah, I've been there. Know that. All right. So people who understand you can instruct you better. Um, and so uh, just one last point. When we have mistakes in life, God not only... Um, gears our mistakes for us to learn from them but he also gears them so we can tell someone else not to come this way and so the similarities you're able to pass that on that's wisdom that's why it's so important for uh, older men to have younger people mentoring and the best way that men can do that is pour into their sons um, I try to tell my kids hey mom and daddy didn't automatically just pop up this way you know uh, I know y'all are enjoying the benefits of it, but <laughs> it was a lot. That was work and the school and the grace of God, all of this. And so don't take it for granted. Uh, you know, I, you try to do better than the next generation. But sometimes in doing so, the next generation begins to be like, oh, I don't really want to do that. I'll be like, hey. You know, I go to another level, I'm like, hey, what are you but just really letting them know that um, where, how you are and where you are, you can't become complacent where you are. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They are energetic. Right. That's right. Right. <laughs> Not there yet. All right. <laughs> okay. Now that's the that's the new forties. You good? But anyway, I I just really you know there's so much that we can share with them that we're kind of doing this in our area. I think so, too. And I think there's a, a, a weakness in any church that has only one group. Now, that's a weakness of similarity. When everything is just the same, you know, have the benefits of diversity of different age groups, different social economic groups, all these type things. So uh, uh, you do need that. And so you see a lot of church splits happen because, oh, uh, well, 
this generation and this generation, we see different. We've already been separated as two churches in the church to begin with. And now this youth pastor goes off and he starts a new church. And, well, you're debating, well, I've always been here, but there seems to, their worship seems to be this way, blah, blah, blah. And that's how church splits start. You're right. Um, I love it here where after a certain age, you're together because that grows up. So you know um, how to worship. Because if you're just doing one thing or hanging around with one group of individuals, you're short-sighted because you're missing out on other knowledge that you need. And so all trends that come, they come and go. But the word of God stays the same. So right now, worship uh, might be this way. But 10 years down the road, it might be this way. So your, is your church going to keep hopping based on the latest trend? Or are you going to stay with the gospel and learn from biblical principles how everyone's supposed to worship and stay together? All right. The value of uh, similarity. People who understand you uh, can encourage you in your struggles. 2 Corinthians uh, 1 and 4 and Hebrews 4 and 15. All right, so as God comforts us, we can comfort someone else with the comfort that we're comforted with, right? Um, and when you think about the incarnation, what does Hebrews 4 and 15 say? Think about it. That's what makes prayer so amazing. You're talking to the Lord, and you're like, Lord, I'm going through this situation. And the Lord is able to sympathize with you and give you help. That's, that's peaceful. Have you ever had an opportunity where you're going through something really tough, and someone that knows you was able to speak into that situation? It's encouragement by someone who gets it. You get it. You understand. And he was like, man, thanks. I needed that. You get it, right? Uh, versus somebody who's like, hey, I haven't been in your situation, but uh, praying for you. God loves you. You know, okay, all right, thanks. You need someone who's like, hey, um, this happened to me, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so you have been, yes. And so advice from a person who gets it really helps you out. Um, and God gets it. Uh, the most important thing, I, uh, one of the most important things I learned is getting honest in prayer with the Lord. I was telling a student on Friday, I said, uh, he's thinking about dating. And I'm think, telling what godly courtship looks like. And I said, uh, God already knows the desires you have. He already knows your motives. And I said, be honest with him with those. And I said, uh, he's omniscient. He already knows. So why not go ahead and tell him? And there's so much uh, relief and help when um, you're talking to the Lord and you're like, Lord, this is the way I feel. This is what I'm struggling with. Can you help me in that situation? And he can because he understands what you're going through. He really gets it. All right. Understanding builds trust. What do you see in 1 Peter 3, 5 through 7? So this woman that Peter's writing to, or women that he's writing to, might be fearful about trusting her husband and making leadership decisions because he made 
do them right, he may do them wrong. But Peter says, by her uh, godly behavior, like women of old, you trusting in God, not your husband. And as God holds the world in his hand, he has your husband in his hand. And as you pray for God, for his uh, direction to guide your family, um, that helps out. But also, he tells the husband to live in understanding with your wife. Know how she is. Know her uh, limits. Know what she's capable of and all these type things. And so when you live and understand it, your prayers will be heard. And so here it is. Understanding builds trust. And as you've been married a couple years, uh, 10, 15, 20, you begin to understand one another, right? Well, I <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but you got there, right? Yeah. There you are. <laughs> it's a, sanctification is a process, and uh, the Lord uses marriage that way as well. So as you're in your relationships, you just know. I, well, someone said, hey, what about doing this? He was like, well, he doesn't like that, or she doesn't like that. Well, I think she'll appreciate this better because you understand the person you're with, right? And so as you're in, you come from two separate worlds and you coming together to live as one you have differences he has differences she has differences and you're thinking about okay so as you're living together you think okay i understand this is better oh okay and so uh like at a football game i'm watching the game this is not the time to ask you about something because i'm focused <laughs> and so uh i mean even at a live game my kids, we talking. I mean, I'm focused. And I'm like, okay, okay, all right, all right. So one time, I think my wife asked something. I was like, ah. And I was like, oh, I just snapped. I was like, hey, sorry, I'm in the game. It's most shows. As time went on, she understood that. In the, in the games, I'm intense. You know, I want to watch it. I'm, at, I'm watching plays. Oh, he's back door. Watch back there, you know. I'm the parent on the side. I was like, watch back door, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I love sports. That's something I gave up one year, though. It was got real bad. So uh, I'd be in the games, you know, watching TV like, I can't believe that was a horrible call. What's going on? And so now I see people in the fans like, man, I, that used to be to you, Brian. So, uh, yeah, so that's a work in progress. Uh, and I think it's even more difficult when you're watching your kids play. Cause Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right. That's right. Yes. Uh, everything you do in life requires work. Uh, matter of fact, before um, sin even entered the situation, Adam was told to work. Um, and keeping the guard. Now work is harder. Because of sin, but work has always been, uh, work out actually brings glory to God. And so we have to work on our marriages. You cannot become complacent. If you're playing basketball, you need to work on that. Be praying for me. Uh, last week, uh, they have an over 40 league there, so I might try to get back out there. So if you see me coming in the cast, you know what happened. <laughs> uh, so work requires, work is needed for basketball football, study, your, your job. If you get complacent with learning at your job, guess what? Hey, somebody younger you get promoted or someone else because you're not current upon the things that apply to your job, right? So, yeah, it's a constantly striving, a, a constant uh, working. Uh, fear is toward it ultimately by trusting God. Uh, to the woman, it's like, hey, that's my husband. He might not always make the best uh, decisions, but I'm trusting God in this situation, right? And God will make it right. And ultimate, the husband says, hey, I need to live in such a way that God will hear my prayers. So I need to live in understanding uh, with my wife. I need to understand what she's going through. I need to understand her struggles. And so both of these uh, uh, things in life helps out. So by understanding one another, it helps you build trust, right? 
You say, I, I trust my husband. We've been together X amount of years. He knows me. And the husband says, I trust my wife. We've been together so many years. He knows me. Because he understands me, I can trust him to do the best for me. And the same thing it is with Jesus Christ. Because he ultimately knows us and his will is the best for our lives, we can trust him to do what's going to bring glory to God in our lives. And so, um, again, uh, I come to this and I, I mention it often. There's several times on the, in, in a year I just have to, it's yours. My wife, my kids, my job, have your way with it. Whatever you want to do, um, whatever your, your will is for my life, have me bow to it. I surrender all. Um, and so you got to constant um, lay it at the feet of Jesus and surrender all to him. Um, parenting. Is another thing I constantly am surrendering to the Lord. Um, and so you're looking at like, ah, am I raising them to be godly men? Should I allow them, ah, I don't know, them hanging around with them. Oh, oh, oh I can't believe he did that, you know. So it's a constant uh, prayer like, oh. And so it's relieving to know um, that God is in control. And so I'm going to do um, on this end what God has required me to do. Um, discipline when need to be. I'm um, going to correct them, uh, exhort them, encourage them, and praying that God ultimately directs their lives when I'm not even around. Um, I'm praying, I've been praying for their wives since they've been in the womb. I've um, been praying for their kids. And so I'm, I'm counting on God to answer prayers when I'm long gone. And so um, it's a total surrender. So that, that, that requires an ultimate trust in the Lord. You got this. And I see society, how it's going, um, the different political things that are going on that are changing, uh, how we view gender, how we view all these type things. And it's scary uh, from a human point of view. Um, I got kids growing up in this, you know. They go to a Christian school, but one day they're going to be out of this holy bubble. And so I don't know if that bubble is even as holy as I think it is. But uh, at the same time, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just, when I, I listen to the briefing and the stuff I hear that Mola talks about, I'm like, oh, my goodness, you know. And so uh, even to the point where uh, China's already cloning humans, and somehow uh, Parent Planhood was uh, selling baby ports. And so my, in my mind, I'm like, I wonder if the technology that China has came from the United States. I wonder if what the parts were going for genetic testing so they could do it. So you never know what's really going on. So uh, that type of stuff is really gets me to thinking. I'm like, wow. Then I think about uh, abortions now are being... Um, I think Mueller was talking about Ireland, who's always been obscure, and now they're voting to do it. And so the culture is changing, like, hugely uh, and going towards hard left. Um, and so in the midst of all of this, uh, my hope is built on Jesus Christ, and it has to be. And that gives me hope when I hear stories like this, uh, when I... Uh, see news stories. I'm just trusting Christ. And that helps me out tremendously. Uh, sometimes watching the news with Jessica just floor you emotionally. You're like, wow, look at look at what's going on. But we serve a sovereign God who's in control of all history. He's always been on the throne. And he's not going to advocate it. And so uh, he's not going to leave it. So it's understanding. So understanding builds trust. I can trust God. I can trust my uh, relationships. All right. Understanding gives grace and exhortation. Look at Galatians 2, 11 through 21.
So think of. My bad, I pulled up too early. I'm sorry. Uh, so think about it. Um, what's Peter doing? That's right. That's right. So when certain people came in, Peter was like, oh, I'm eating with these Gentiles. Oh, they come in. Hey, how are you doing? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'll be back. So he's playing both sides, right? He's doing, and so uh, what is Peter's background? What is his ethnic background? He's a Jew. And what did Paul do? That's right, because his background is what? A Jew. So he, he knew something about his background, right? So he was able to have grace to speak into a situation that he saw that was clearly wrong. And so when you have, this is another example of similarity. Uh, you're from a Jewish background. I'm from a Jewish background. We both follow Christ. And what you're doing, you're trying to tell them what Christ did. He already satisfied the law. Now you're trying to put them back under the law. It's not right. Why are you doing that? Because if you're going to try to live by the law, you're actually saying, because there's no way to be perfect under the law. So he says, you know, you're actually a transgressor because it's actually you're telling a lie. You live one way in the, here, and then you live one way there. That's a lie. So you're a sinner. You stand condemned. But if you're under Christ, by believing in Christ, through faith, you're justified. God sees you rightly. So why are you acting this way as if your works is the way you're justified by God? So uh, there's a tendency uh, as you're a believer to slip back into what you used to do. And as a Christian, you become legalistic. And that's what happened in Luke 15. I can't believe this. You've killed a fatted calf. You gave him this robe. You give him the sandals. He's lived out here with prostitutes. He's out here and spent all your money, and you're doing this for this, your son? He's disgusted. I've never done that. I've always been here. I've always worked for you. Both sons were lost. One was reconciled. The older brother, he was lying because when the property was divided it was actually his so he's been working on his own stuff but he was deceived and thinking that he's working for his father because when the father passed it belonged to him so actually all the stuff that he received he was upset because you're giving away my stuff and so when you look uh in life and when you're trying to address someone uh, having similar backgrounds helps out tremendously because you have a mutual understanding you know where i'm coming from right you understand, you see the similarity. And so you don't become legalistic in how you act. And so Paul calls him on it. And so he's given grace because you're Jew, I'm Jew, we both follow Christ. Yeah, you're right. And uh, Paul is given an extremely gracious amount of grace because he didn't do it one-on-one. Hey, let me talk to you. You see that he did it in front of everybody. He was like, hey, man, what's up? I'm like, whoa, what? Why are you doing this? He did it in front of everyone. And so, uh, and Peter was gracious enough to take it. So it really shows his, uh, his character as well. I know I'm wrong. I'm willing to be rebuked publicly because it's wrong. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, it was such a huge gospel issue because when I think when you look in Acts 15, the Judaizer, it was a big movement where uh, another group was coming and saying, hey, in order for you to follow Christ, yeah, that's good, but you need to become circumcised. You need to do everything we've done as Jews plus follow Christ. It's like Jesus plus something else in order to be saved. And so it was such a big issue uh, 
Paul is like, hey, man, this, is, this needs to stop now. And this is such a big issue. And what you're doing, you're an apostle. You walk with Christ. You saw Christ. And people are looking at you, and your witness uh, is going to affect. You preach in Pentecost, so you're well known. I mean, <laughs> he's a big-time guy, you know. This is like a John MacArthur or a John Piper. It's like, wait a minute, man. Come on, people. You're going to cause many people to stumble. So I think that was the uh, gist of the public rebuke uh, because people look up to him. And so if he's, can you imagine you come out of nowhere, the Lord sits upon you, you get up, and 3,000 souls are saved if your first message. You just start a mega, mega church, a poof, first sermon. You're a discipling, and the movement is rolling. And everybody's like, hey, man, every language that Peter brought it today, wow. Did you see that? Wow, God used him today. So now everyone sees you as being a vessel of God. So you must be uh, corrected publicly, right? Because it's such a big deal. And you see that with um, elders in the church. If they falter, let them be corrected publicly. Because a lot of people follow them, right? And so you got to show, hey, they're not above sin. They need to be corrected as well. And so I think that's what was going on. Because it was such a serious issue. And it would call many uh, people to stumble. All right, so we must... uh, pursue the right balance so we need to recognize we need multiple uh, types of relationships so think about it for a balanced meal if uh, you or your kids or whoever constantly just eat chocolate bars suckers you're going to be weak right you're going to get cavities you're not going to be as healthy right you need a balanced meal right you need bread well, I'm learning the older I get, I need less bread because those cars blow me up. <laughs> but you need, you need a balanced meal. You need uh, uh, green stuff on your plate, you know. That's why, how I always look when I'm, I'm trying to try to have something green. But having something green and you got french fries, hamburger, and all that, that's not, you know, it could be a green soda. No. So uh, you need to have a balance. Balance. Uh, and meals and balance in relationships. Older couples, younger couples, babes in Christ, mature saints. You need to have a, just a well-rounded blend. And guess what? Because you hang around uh, balanced uh, friends or believers in Christ, it in turn makes you a balanced person in Christ. Right? So, uh uh, I'm reading a book called Connected, and it shows how we each have social networks, and we're all connected. And like a friend of your friend, what you do may affect them or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Some of that, yeah, and nah. But we are connected. And if I'm going through something, or maybe I'm not going through something, and I see a godly couple in the church going through something, and they're still worshiping God, they're praising God, they're still following him. Guess what? That encouraged me. Like, why am I complaining? Can you imagine what they're going through and they're still trusting God? All right. You need to, I need to pull up my pants and stop talking. Not Stop being a wimp. Come on. They're following Christ and they're going through all of this. I need to suck it up and stop complaining. Right? It helps you in your godly walk, right? They're going through cancer. They're going through a chemo. Just had a leg amputated. And they're still following Christ. Here I have two good legs and I'm complaining. Something's wrong with this picture. I need to repent. Lord, help me. And so that's why you need a well balance. And then you need people who are just knuckleheads. Oh, my goodness. You're such an idiot. What are you doing? You don't say that to them, but it's like, oh, because... It makes you appreciate where you are and the grace of God that you're where you are. So then it calls you not to look down on that person. So he was like, hey, had not been for the grace of God, I wouldn't be where I am. So I need to come where you are. 
Oh, I can't believe we keep coming here. Come on. All right, walk with this person because if you know Christ, someone has shared the gospel with you. Someone has taken the time to meet you right where you are and walk you to where you need to go. And so we need that. Be honest about what kind of church culture we have. And that's the only way you can get help is being honest. Where are we, are, where are we as a church? Think about that. Learn how to build understanding without similarity. And how do you do that? Realizing that what? Starts with an I. M. A. G. E. There you go. All right. Woo. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're all similar because we're all image bearers, right? We all made the image of God. So it's, that's the similarities, right? All right. A little spelling test there, all right? All right. Recognize that some people may need more similarity than others. You know, you just got to realize there's different type of individuals in this world. So some people might need a lot more in common with you before you can move forward with them, right? So, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a UK fan. All right, we're good, right? <laughs> so different similarities or whatever other team you like. Uh, so you need similarities. Or, matter of fact, maybe sports sometimes is a good way to talk to non-believers, you know? Uh, I think sometimes uh, being in church, sometimes our friendships uh, end up solely being those within the church. And we only see stuff in this bubble. And sometimes when we get out to public um, places, we can uh, meet others who are not like us. Aspire to relationships where similarity isn't necessary. I don't know what that would be, though. But uh, aspire to relationships where similarity isn't necessary. What kind of relationship would that be? Mm-hmm. There you go. That's right. Right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That, that is exactly right. Uh, so sometimes we feel like, all right, as I mentioned my previous example, all right, you're a UK fan, well, I can run with you um, and begin to learn about you. But what if you just meet somebody and you don't have anything in common other than being an image bearer? So there's always some, something in common with someone. And so you can move forward with that. <coughs> Uh, see similarity as a special and potential dangerous stewardship. Um, the benefit is a natural understanding that helps us in powerful ways, as we, as we just mentioned, Paul and Peter, right? Because they have similar background, they were able to um, talk through a serious issue. Uh, when we have relationships that share a few things in common, we need to see that as a special stewardship. Because now um, I have to work harder in that relationship because we don't have that much in common. And the reason why it's a special stewardship is because it's easier for me to leave that relationship because we don't have that much in common. So that's a special stewardship. I need to really work hard in that relationship because I really don't have that much in common in the first place. So I can easily say, okay, well, I try. All right. I, hey, Lord, I, I did my best, you know. Uh, let's use that similarity for God's honor and glory, not just our comfort. So it's easier to befriend people who you're comfortable around. Remember, similarity, trust, peace, difference, danger. Uh, it's going to take work. I got to trust, you know. So we need to use uh, our similarities for God's honor and glory and not just comfort. 
already. 